<laughs> now I know why you said oh crap. Had to come up here. Okay. Our third round table is cross-boundary invasive species management. And invasives have come up in our first two panels. We know how big an issue it is. We were uh, fortunate to host, I gather, and Mike may hit on it a little bit, a, the first sort of national invasives conference which brought a lot of different folks together for the first time that worked on it through the Andrus Center in Boise a couple, couple years ago now. But it, it got things going, I guess, and it might, again, it might be something our first speaker, Mike Elamini from the U.S. Forest Service, who is the program manager of invasives there, might talk about. He'll be followed by Rusty Lloyd, program director of Rivers Edge West, and then Elizabeth Brown, the invasive species coordinator for the Colorado Department of Parks and Wildlife, and followed by Scott Cameron, who is the acting assistant secretary for policy and management and budget in the Department of Interior. So, Mike, you want to kick it off? Okay, thanks, John. This has been really fun already this week, uh, and and having Bill Whitaker uh, organize this effort with uh, the WGA's uh, coordination of some data management issues, and 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 as John mentioned, uh, back in 2015, we had the Boise Weed Summit, uh, the Anderson Center hosted and and coordinated. 250 people came together talking about landscape scale approaches. This is about sage grouse stuff, and the weed problem. Um, and oh my gosh, you know, out of that came so many deliverables, so many people pulling together stepping up and and to this day in fact today and yesterday um, pieces of that summit are still underway so we're there's there's still successes so John you wasn't a total failure um, it was actually uh, it worked but let me give you a little perspective here that we've some things we've learned on invasives and the landscape scale approach and um, let's, let's see what you're up against you got uh, you got an invasive species problem that's about a, between 150 to 180 billion dollar a year impact to the United States economy every year. That's a hole in the bucket that you can barely fill. That's, that's drilling holes in pretty much any boat you have got trying to float out there on conservation. Um, this is affecting economies at every scale, the environment, the human health, uh, plant health, animal health, uh, cultures, infrastructure, national security. So you're up against a big problem. The, the invasive weed footprint Economically and ecologically, the impacts are 23 times larger than the top 10 wildfires in recorded history added together. The Forest Service's expenditure in 2015 for wildfire suppression was bigger than the entire U.S. government spent on all tax of invasive species across all government agencies in the same year. Something's backwards. So we're talking about landscape scale here. You're up against a big, big threat. Um, it's impacting pretty much anything we do, and we're talking about how do we step it up and scale it up to confront this challenge. So when we talked about landscape scales in the invasive species arena, some things that we've, we've learned, some things we've picked up on there. You know, it's, it's not a complex issue here. It's not a complex concept. Um, there isn't a single way to define how big something is to be landscape scale. It's not by acres. You know, it could be a watershed, it could be a ranch, it could be lots of things. But what we did learn is it's about avoiding a myopic approach, being narrow in the way you address things, being um, unwilling to work with traditional and non-traditional partners. Uh, one of the things that's come up, um, we might have heard a little bit about this already, is, you know, the invasive plant problem um, in the West with the sage grouse issue. Uh, you know, largely this was thought of as like a wildlife problem. But the players who have the ability to control the policy and the programs to fight the number one threat affecting the, the habitat, weeds, are coming from the State Departments of Agriculture. So non-traditional partners, people who didn't think about stepping up with the Department of Agriculture sometimes. So look what's happened. They've all come together now. It's really working out much better. Also, collaborating outside of your small circle. You know, we, we all have a sign on our chest, what's in it for us? We've learned you can't always think about it. You've got to ask yourself, what's in it for my neighbor? What can I do to help them? Success is based on how well we work with others. Collaborating across disciplines, across concepts, across perspectives. It's not just biologically we're doing this. We're doing this economically, socially, culturally. 
Um, for your, if you're a Native American in the northeastern United States, uh, you're up against a problem from an emerald ash borer that's wiping out ash trees. Well, we have a lot of ash trees around the country. Well, that's not so big a deal for some people. Like, who cares? It's just an ash tree. Well, baseball bats are made out of ash trees. So hold on to those baseball bats. It might be a collector's item one day. But if you're a Native American, you need black ash to build traditional baskets and snowshoes. So you're losing your culture when you lose ash trees from an invasive insect. Geographically, we're looking at this across all aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. The concepts of CWMAs, Cooperative Weed Management Associations or Organizations, or CISMAs, Cooperative Invasive Species Management Organizations, those are models of success across the landscape where players that come together, stakeholders that um, are in a geographic area, join forces. Sometimes they ship in with money, sometimes just ideas, sometimes equipment, solutions are brought together and a common, kind of like stone soup, ends up uh, becoming a whole. When you do this coming together, you're also building together. So we heard that from some of the other panels. What you build together, you, you share together, and you also can achieve together. So that's also succeeding together. We also learned that this all hands, all lands kind of concept is not unique to conservation. There's a lot of other things that go on that way, and of course invasives can use that same approach. The problem is a global problem, so we gotta look internationally. It's a holistic problem, you heard that term, holistic uh, approaches, that's sort of hand in glove with the landscapes go approach, looking at this from much different perspectives and from a different angle, and sometimes you're not the one to provide that angle, somebody else might be. We have a diverse array of capacities, capabilities, skills, programs, and relationships. You heard that a lot so far, relationships. If you can't figure out how to solve this over a cup of coffee, you haven't built your relationship. You build that relationship and you'll find a solution. People will come together, it's human nature. We're social, we like this. We have mechanisms, processes, authorities, like in the Forest Service, you heard about good neighbor authorities, and lots of other things other agencies have to help facilitate collaboration and sharing of resources. Again, supporting our way to take a holistic landscape scale approach. And our best work is always done in collaboration with others. Once in a while, you have to hang out there by yourself. You know, there's no doubt starting small is sometimes the first step you have to take. But as it grows, more and more will join in, and we've learned this has been the solution to fighting invasives across this broad spectrum of risks and threats uh, things like uh, white nose syndrome, you might have heard of that. The pathogen that kills native bats. Why is that important to all of us? Well, you get 100% mortality on bats, and bats are important because you can't grow corn without bats. They control corn earworm. They also eat their weight in forest eating insects, native and exotic ones, every night. So you're going to see declines in forests because you have a decline in bats. Chytrid fungus, feral pigs, Aquatic nuisance species issues like what's happening in Montana with the movement of aquatic mussels moving their way towards the Columbia River system and potentially up into the Alaska region. So start small, do the doable, do what's necessary, and soon you'll be doing the impossible. You don't have to physically reorganize necessarily to achieve this collaboration. You don't have to move your office, you don't have to move your, your position, you just necessarily need to rethink and reorganize how you work with others, how you build relationships, and how you collaborate. And you can stay right where you are. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me. I think I have a power, yeah, here we go. Um, appreciate uh, Bill Whitaker having us uh, here today talk about invasive species, something that we're, uh, uh, we're set up to uh, help manage for y'all. Uh, my name is Rusty Lloyd. I'm the program director for a small nonprofit called River's Edge West. We're located in western Colorado. We work with many local, state, and federal governments, uh, private landowners, other NGOs uh, to control invasive plant species across the west and help restore riparian areas uh, across the West as well. We, uh, you know, our mission is really to, uh, to do the restoration, not only um, control invasive species, but we do want native uh, habitat back for, for the benefit of our, 
ecological benefits, our socioeconomic benefits. We want to make sure that uh, these rivers and riverine, riverine systems are in a place where we can, uh, they can produce the benefits that we need, that we all depend on living in the West. And we do that through education, technical assistance, and collaboration with all uh, the agencies in this room, private landowners, and across the landscape. You know, our vision is a healthy riparian forest, a network of healthy riparian forests and habitats across the American West, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we inherently work across uh, cross boundary areas. We we since we've been in a, uh, since we're incorporated, we've worked hard to break down uh, the barriers to cross boundary restoration and invasive species control at a, at a landscape scale. Uh, again, I think past other presenters have declined to define what landscape scale is, but you can kind of. Uh, you can define that for your own. It's kind of through the eye of the beholder. It could be a watershed, it could be a, a forest system, it could be a, an ecosystem itself. But we try to break down those barriers. We work with these agencies to help do that, and we want to continue to do that. Um, there are some concerns on our rivers in the West, of course. I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but invasive species are quickly becoming uh, some of the most populated plant species along our rivers, and so we're trying to kind of I don't know if we can reverse it, but I think we're trying to slow it down, stop it, or at least try to get it back to where it's in a better state. Um, many, many, many different types of uh, invasive plant species that we work with, not only woody invasive species, but herbaceous species. And uh, we, uh, we don't solely focus on uh, any one. I forgot to mention that uh, River's Edge West is kind of our new name. Uh, some of you might know us by a uh, former name called the Tamaris Coalition. We actually just switched our, our, our name two weeks ago. So um, invasive plant impacts, uh, it impacts not only the ecological processes, but recreational, ag production, so on and so forth. We do want to uh, um, do what we can. You know, we mow it, we whack it, we spray it, uh, but that only gets you so far. We... Uh, we do want to uh, we do want to get it back to diversity, as as Mike kind of pointed out. We we care about bass. We care about um, uh, big ungulates. We care about avian species. We care about all those things. And uh, we need to focus a little bit more on the other cycles of restoration and invasive species control, all the way from the planning and researching, probably even backing up past that to maybe some of the policy making and infrastructure that supports these things. All the way through implementation and, and the monitoring and the funding that goes into it. We want to concentrate on some of those, uh, those different aspects. Um, I echo what some have said about collaboration, but I argue that that can only get you so far. Um, I think there's a, a recipe for success that needs to be um, hand in hand with collaboration and thinking, rethinking through some of the policy and frameworks that support collaboration, federal agencies collaborating with, with nonprofits and states, how to get work done, uh, enabling and having cohesive policy frameworks, rethinking and addressing operational needs, capacity, huge capacity issues out there. I guess I'm probably preaching to the choir to say that you know capacity is is really a struggle these days on trying to get some of these landscape scale cross boundary issues uh, addressed, and then lastly is rethinking funding strategies. Um, that was a great statistic that that Mike had about all um, about how much funding is used in firefighting versus invasive species. Um, I think that you know there needs to be a little bit more focus on how. Funding is generated all the way from the legislative actions till it hits the ground. Fle flexible financial tools. How can that money hit the ground? How can it be used and who can use it? So I think those uh, recipes for success needs to go in hand in hand with the collaboration. So I think that's about all I have and thanks for having me. Good afternoon. 
Uh, thank you for having me here to uh, participate in this important discussion. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, the Colorado Invasive Species Program is an all-taxa approach across terrestrial and aquatic. Um, but I'm going to specifically speak about our Aquatic Invasive Species, or AIS, program today. Um, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the AIS program in Colorado, um, something I'm, I'm pretty proud of. It started as a, a response effort to the detection of quagga mussels in Lake Mead in 2007. The West was forever changed when quagga mussels were found in Lake Mead. Um, in 2008, just one year later, we had a veliger. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's a microscopic baby zebra quagga mussel um, in Pueblo Reservoir, which is our highest used state park for boating. So it's a really incredibly big deal. Um, our legislature chose, and our state chose, to take a different stance on zebra and quagga mussels. We decided to choose prevention. We chose cross-jurisdictional partnerships, and we reacted very quickly. We made a conscious decision we were not going to fall victim to zebra and quagga mussels. It was not going to be inevitable. And if we do, we're not going down without a fight. Um, 10 years later, I am proud to say there are no adult infestations of zebra or quagga mussels in the state of Colorado. And you will find that states that took that same approach can say the same thing. Um, this has not been an easy 10 years. It's been a wild roller coaster. I won't shortcut it. Uh, it's, it's been up and down. Uh, we have the largest mandatory inspection decontamination program in the nation in Colorado. And what that means is that you cannot launch your boat without submitting to an inspection. It's a condition of using our waters. Our friends from the east don't really understand that, but those of you out here in the west understand that water is gold and every, count, every little drop is owned. So when we talk about landscape scale and multi-jurisdictional partnership, at one reservoir, just as an example, I have a federal owner, typically Bureau of Reclamation or Army Corps of Engineers. I may have a state, a local, or a federal recreation manager. The water's owned by somebody else. We manage the fisheries. Um, there's towns and counties economically tied to those reservoirs. Uh, so I think the term Jurisdictional soup came up a minute. That's what I deal with every day, jurisdictional soup. So landscape scale may be one reservoir. It may be the entire state, or it may be the region or the nation, or any division in between. And I gotta watch my clock because I like to talk. Uh, um, so while Colorado was implementing their program, the Western region was really struggling with how to deal with Lake Mead at all levels of government and private industry. Uh, through the leadership of the Western Regional Panel and the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, we drafted, um, at a congressional request, the Quagga Zebra Action Plan. That plan was implemented. That plan was uh, partially funded through the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and imagine that writing a plan didn't solve the problem. We didn't have a common language. We didn't have a common understanding of what needed to be done. We just wanted mussels to stop moving on boats. Uh, so the Western Regional Panel, and I'll cut to the chase, um, have undergone an extensive facilitated discussion amongst Western AIS coordinators for the last six years, and we're right at the end of it. The tools are available. Now we need people to pick up the tools and implement them. Legal authority is a big deal. We have gone through such extensive legal authority changes in the Western U.S. that the National Sea Grant Law Center can't keep up with all the changes. Um, so harmonizing laws and regulations, having common educational messaging, relationships and trust is absolutely key. Um, there's no question about it. We opened a boating last week. I've had four muscle boats. And almost every single one of them, three out of the four, I knew were coming because the states notified me because we're, we're on that, we have that relationship. Um, we have a database that we use across the West that eight states are using and more are coming on board. We have one database for boat inspections and decontaminations. So these things can be done. We're talking about changing how one of our biggest user groups uses our waters, changing their behavior. We want people boating, we want people fishing, we want people moving, just clean, drain, dry. I gotta say the clean, drain, dry in every presentation I give. So moving forward, I would love to see this looked at as a model that can be replicated for other vectors. We're doing vector management versus finding a species 
and then trying to kill it. We can't kill zebra and quagga mussels. So um, it's really been truly a fun process, probably one of the, my favorite things I've done in my, in my career to date. But we're not done. We have a long way to go. There's other species, other vectors. But there is a framework there. So um, things are light years ahead of where they used to be. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Delighted to be with you to, today. Uh, having the opportunity to speak to this group uh, brings back a number of memories. Uh, John, you'd have no way of knowing this, but my first job out of graduate school was at the Department of Interior, and Cecil Andrus was the secretary at the time. Uh, and a few years later, I found myself uh, working for the governor of California, got very heavily involved with uh, NGA and WGA at, at that point. And that uh, was in 1996. And one of the first things I did was to lobby Jim Oxbury relentlessly when he was working on the Appropriations Committee, trying to get, uh, well, I was trying to get more money for California, not surprisingly, at that point. So uh, being with you today gives me opportunity to relive a lot of uh, very significant old memories. At this point, I'm very pleased to be working for uh, Secretary Ryan Zinke at the Department of the Interior in, in Washington. Uh, when uh, Secretary Zinke came on board in March of 2017, he fairly shortly identified uh, 10 priorities that he wanted to pursue during his tenure as secretary, and a number of these relate to our topic this afternoon, one of which <coughs> was trying to strengthen uh, the trust that our state and local uh, government partners might have in their relationship with the Department of the Interior. One manifestation of that was about two weeks after he was sworn in, uh, Secretary Zinke got a letter from Governor Otter saying, please work with WGA and do something about keeping quagga mussels out of the Columbia River Basin. The secretary turned to me and he said, this is your job, make this happen. That launched us down a path, Bill Whitter can tell stories, a, a path I think we're only about halfway uh, through at this point but led to an announcement of 40 initiatives uh, in June of, of 2017. And we recently came up with a, a report card a couple of weeks ago on how we're doing on those 40 odd initiatives. A second area that's a priority for the secretary is striking a regulatory balance. And I think there are at least two areas that are applicable here. The first is the National Environmental Policy Act compliance takes too long and costs too much money. Uh, if we're going to be spending millions of dollars and spending months or, God help us, years doing NEPA compliance when the generation time on some of our invasive species is six months or a year, uh, by the time we finally get around to going after those things, we're going to have, at the very least, a much more expensive and expansive problem than uh, we would have had if we were really able to do early detection, rapid response up front. So one of the things we're looking at interior is a notion of more categorical exclusions that would apply in the invasive species arena. The second uh, hook, if you will, on striking a regulatory balance relates to what was mentioned uh, earlier in terms of uh, the relationship between endangered species and invasive species. Fish and Wildlife Service will tell you that more than 20, more than 40% of the species that are listed under the ESA are on the endangered species list, at least in part because some invasive has done something to them. So my way of thinking about this is roughly 40% of the blood, sweat, and tears that we all experience in the context of the Endangered Species Act can at least be indirectly attributable to the fact that invasives are out there clobbering our, our, our native species. Uh, the third priority of the secretary that's relevant is he's really interested in promoting outdoor recreation, in particular hunting and fishing. And I think there's no doubt that in, invasive species complicate uh, our ability uh, in, uh, to, to manage hunting and, and fishing. Uh, shifting uh, briefly to the landscape scale notion, when the secretary came uh, into the department as part of his uh, orientation to our bureaus, he learned that all of our bureaus have different boundaries uh, for their regional offices. And uh, one of the things he wanted to do was to enhance coordination across our bureaus. So he asked a fairly simple question. Why can't all our bureaus have the same regional boundaries? And uh, that led us to a discussion of, well, if we were going to have 
all of our bureaus having the same regional boundaries, how would we define those boundaries? So the secretary's undergraduate degree was in geology. Uh, he has an orientation towards science. So his first reaction was, how about drawing those regional boundaries based on ecosystems? Well, you get six ecologists in a room and they'll draw ecosystem boundaries eight different ways, or maybe 12 different ways. So that wasn't too productive. His next reaction was, well, how about watersheds? USGS knows what watersheds are. Everyone agrees what watersheds look like. So version 1.0 of the, of the Secretary's notion about unified regional boundaries was based on watershed. So, so it, it turns out that when the 50 states entered the Union, not surprisingly, they did not draw their boundaries based on watersheds. So we heard from another governor, a number of governors, you know, it's kind of inconvenient having two or three different uh, uh, common regions in my one state. I'd really like to have just one uh, interior department region for my whole state. So um, the, what we essentially did was we took uh, those watershed boundaries and we said, okay, let's try to uh, be responsive to the governors. We're talking about um, uh, being responsive to them. Let's walk the walk. So uh, the secretary agreed to try to find the nearest state boundary to those watersheds as, as a general principle. And that's what refl is reflected in the, uh, in, in the map you see up, up here. So this is very conspicuously a labeled draft. We're still having lots of discussions. I think the secretary has probably spoken to somewhere between eight and a dozen Western governors individually ab about this and endless numbers of members of Congress. Uh, but uh, the, the notion here is interior fields that will be very beneficial, not just for invasive species management, but more broadly in terms of the way the department does business. If all our senior managers in a region are actually looking at the same geography as opposed to looking at different geographies and having unified regions, common regions, is, uh, is, is one way of, of facilitating that. So um, I don't know if I've eaten up my first my six minutes. One minute more. Okay. Uh, I think it's very, uh, it's very important to, to, to realize that what uh, Elizabeth was able to do in, in, in Colorado is remarkable, but it's not the only place in the only time in the history of man we've been able to deal with the invasive species issue. The National Invasive Species Council just came out with a report on success stories. Uh, and I think it's useful for all of us to reflect on the fact that this may be a significant problem, but it's a solvable problem. It takes leadership, a little bit of money, and uh, some organization, and a lot of cooper cooperation and coordination across jurisdictions, but we can beat this problem. So um, I just wanted to put in that one plug to make sure everybody comes up on a, on a high note at, at, the, at the end of the afternoon and is, is not depressed by the challenges in front of us. Thank you. So as always, we'll start for, with some questions. And, and Scott, actually, you said something that, that leads us right into our first question, which I think is kind of a provocative one. What does landscape scale invasive species management mean? Does it mean to manage for native species or to manage against invaders or both? Anybody want to take that one on? What do we mean? Uh, I'll jump in and then someone more intelligent than me can fall in behind me. I, I think we need to focus on what the resource objectives are. What are the resource management objectives in, in the geography, frankly? Uh, I think you've got to start with the basics. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's both, um, and it certainly needs to be driven by the management intention for, for, uh, for those partners, but going back to what was said earlier, um, all the players need to be at the table within that landscape. You have to build it together from the beginning versus the example of showing up with a plan and asking people to implement it. That, that doesn't work very well. Um, so the engagement right off the get-go, and then echo what Mike said, the, inter the interactions need to be understood because if you're managing for an invasive species, you don't want to create another problem. And so we need to be looking holistically at these landscapes and looking at, at um, how those relationships exist. So yeah, I'll add to this, and the groups and the people that get together will help define what that is. They will do that. They will do that. Good answer. Yes, go 
go ahead. I don't know if I have anything to add, but I, I would agree. I think it, it depends on the objectives. I, I think it depends on the landscape itself and what ecosystem you're talking about. And uh, I, I really think that you do have to manage for invasive species and manage for, for what you want uh, simultaneously. Okay, the next question, <coughs> it's it kind of a tough one in a way. Um, how should land managers attempt to balance all the other resource needs against the effort to control or eradicate invasive species. We all know that managers have a whole plate of things they're expected to do sort of at the same time. So how should they, how should they deal with invasives versus their other resource needs? Let me start with this one. Um, pray a lot first, <laughs> you know, but I think the easiest way to start is just make sure that you integrate invasive species management into all the other aspects of what you're doing. Kind of like safety, it's kind of part of everybody's job. It's not a standalone thing that you have to figure out how to give up something to do it. You merge it together, that's what I've seen. Is it works best if you're integrating this, so if you're doing timber management, you're integrating invasive species aspects into that program. If you're a recreation person, you're doing the same thing. If you're a wildlife person, you're finding a way to do your part, and it integrates. Anybody else? I guess I'd, uh, I'd add to that uh, that uh, it's certainly true that whether you're um, working for a federal agency or you're working for a state agency, uh, the Congress or your state legislature has given you a variety of things to do. And it's not like you can walk away from any one of those particular responsibilities. But one way of looking at it is as I'm trying to achieve my multiple objectives, uh, accomplish the goals of the multiple statutes that have been assigned to my agency, are there particular uh, challenges that threaten uh, more than one of those activities? And I think more often than not, we'd find invasive species are a threat to half a dozen of our resource management objectives. So in a sense, you can do a risk analysis and, and, and prioritize where you spend your money in terms of what's gonna be the greatest threat to the widest variety of your missions. Anybody else? Go ahead. I think, I think quickly, uh, I, I think the analysis of what's at stake uh, should be, you know, part of the balance. If, if there's a huge amount of uh, socioeconomic um, values at stake, I think that that should really play into how, how invasive species manages, uh, you know, resources are allocated or balanced against other, other objectives. Um, so just to add on a, a final note, I think that because invasive species do impact so many other types of land and water management, they provide a very unique opportunity for leveraging your resources and increasing your capacity with your partners. Because we all don't have enough resources and nobody has the, the capacity that we'd like. So in the case of the zebra and quagga mussels, we have folks at the table that normally wouldn't sit around the table together. Um, because they can all agree they don't want zebra and quagga mussels, despite the fact that they may not want them for different reasons. And that has um, enabled us to do a lot more with less, um, because we've been able to, to cross a lot of those um, boundaries, uh, because we all want the same thing at the end. So getting crystal clear on what you want and, and what other folks can provide can eventually help to, help to get the job done. So we heard from Elizabeth of a success story with quagga mussels. So playing on that, are there other recent examples of success in landscape level invasive species management? And where have we made maybe the most progress in the last 10 years? Anybody want to give us something else that they can point to that said, hey, we did that sort of right? Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the oldest and probably the most successful is not in the West, but look at sea lamprey management in the Great Lakes. I mean, in the 1950s, 1960s, there was a $7 billion fishery at risk. You had uh, lake trout, uh, whitefish, practically uh, every other large species of fish in the Great Lakes population uh, potentially being driven to near extinction, and a little bit of uh, smart science coming out of of the federal agencies and a lot of cooperation, the US and Canada, state and provinces, I won't say we've completely licked that problem, but we've got it well under control, 90, 95% control of sea lampreys. Uh, that was international cooperation with multiple states. 
time. Yeah, the, um, if you look back in the history of agriculture protection of plant and animal health, uh, there's a lot of successes that, and a lot of things that this country has done to keep itself safe. That's why we're so successful in our agricultural community. And forestry is even finding new solutions to problems that we've experienced in recent years. So we're, we're finding ways to genetically improve our stocks so they're resistant. We're looking at things to find new solutions to some of these insects and diseases. So those are successes too that were almost thought of as impossible to solve. But, but technology is part of that. Go ahead. I don't know if it's a um, success across uh, vast landscapes, but uh, the map that I had up earlier in my presentation, I think there's lots of examples of um, great collaboration um, in conjunction with using flexible tools, um, flexible funding strategies, you know, addressing, you know, a lack of capacity with state and federal agencies. Um, and I, I think that it is done on, on pretty big landscapes, you know, you know, 50 to 200 mile uh, watershed restoration projects across, you know, one of the examples is the Dolores River Restoration Partnership in conjunction with the Bureau of Land Management in Colorado. We work across four BLM district, uh, four BLM offices, three districts, and two states, and we share a common pot of, of money that can be spent across states, across um, um, federal boundaries, across state boundaries, and even to private boundaries. And we've, we've simply kind of erased jurisdictional boundaries for a, temp a temporary amount of time, and I think there's a lot of those successes around the Southwest um, that we're involved with that can be replicated if there's a, a continuing, you know, support and, and flexible tools. Rusty, you said something in your presentation, and we have a question kind of related to that then. When you talked about collaboration is very important, but we need to think about policy change as well. So how does the current suite of invasive species management laws and regs help or hamper cross-boundary invasive species management? And would a common statutory and regulatory framework be helpful? And obviously, would that be difficult to attain that? So a policy, anybody's welcome to answer this, obviously. Um, so we, the Western Regional Panel on Aquatic Mutants and Species identified, um, we, we published, or the ANS Task Force approved the Quagga Zebra Action Plan in 2010. And then in 2012, we, we figured out two years later that the, we, we didn't solve the problem doing that. Um, and the first thing we did, it was obvious we had authority barriers. We had legal and regulatory um, and, and internal policy challenges that prohibited uh, folks from implementing kind of the common uh, tools, if you will. And so uh, in that particular case, we brought in state attorney generals, we brought in uh, chiefs of law enforcement and AIS professionals, and we really dug into what are the legal authorities. If you don't know them, you can't fix them. Um, we're now six years later, um, WACWA last year passed a resolution uh, to help standardize some regulations across the Western US. Um, States have been adopting legal provisions. We have a model law that was published by AFWA, a model regulation published by AFWA, a gap analysis published by the National Sea Grant Law Center, and now we're finishing up with a model MOU for cross-jurisdictional implementation according to all these standards. So while it has taken some time, it's got us to the point, and we've done that in tandem with our federal partners, of course, because we're all in this game together, um, to identify where are those holes um, where can we make change and where we can't. But if you don't start with a common understanding, because you know, there's some finger pointing going on out there and you're going, well, why can't you do this? They literally can't, they gotta change their rules. So if you don't know that, you can't work collaboratively. So you kinda have to start with that common knowledge. And yes, I do believe we can harmonize laws and regs across jurisdictions if, if we want to. I'll, uh, I'll jump in and I'll elaborate on some of Elizabeth's, po Elizabeth's points. So, you know, there's, a, there's, there's an old saying, there ought to be a law against that. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the problem is when you, when you start in, engaging a legislature on, on any topic, you're never quite sure what's going to come out at the other end mm -hmm. of, of the process. And uh, you know, I was a, 
a congressional staffer for a number of years, and my experience was it took four years to get anything the least little bit complex out of, the co out of a Congress, any Congress, and onto the President's desk. Now, I'll, I'll grant the principle that state legislatures are more efficient and maybe they can get something done in one year or two years, but the point is uh, we ought to make the most of the authorities that we already have. For instance, uh, the National Park Service has the authority to, at the request of a state, enforce state law on NPS lands. So rather, I would suggest rather than trying to amend federal uh, authorizations for NPS, let's just sign some MOUs between willing state governments and the Park Service and go do it. <laughs> yep, Scott, that's yes, right on target. Uh, um, a lot of times people think that we can't do it because we don't have the right authorities in place, but there's a ton of authorities. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. We have been doing conservation work forever, right? So there's tons of capacity. There's Sykes Acts and multiple sustained yield acts and you name it, endangered species acts. And all these give us a tool to function. So sometimes it's more about, an, it's an 80% game, you know? You don't have to have 100%, you don't have to have a silver bullet. If you can do 80%, sometimes that makes a difference. I'll just add, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm advocating for, for new uh, frameworks, new policies, new laws and regulations. However, I think rethinking how some of them can be administered, specifically, like funding. Um, you know, a lot of state agencies, even federal agencies, um, administer grants and put out grants. How do you do invasive species management if you get a 12-month grant? Uh, you know, I think through some of these, some of these funding strategies that the, the states and, and, and federal agencies kind of administer, I think they can do a better job at uh, maybe restructuring those to be more copacetic with, with, with landscape scale invasive species management. Um, it's, it's very difficult to work in kind of 12 month increments in funding on, on a vast landscape. Okay, with that, we're, we're sort of to keep things going, we're just out of time for this.